evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> All right, who interrupt, boys? The shadow. Yes, the shadow. Out over the cold hills to the state's prison. Shadow comes for revenge. The computer's going to tell us who the shadow is. The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you're not afraid of death. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Agents of the Shadowcast report for the only podcast on the internet exclusively devoted to the immortal exploits of the Pulps, Comics, and Radio's Dark Avenger, The Shadow. I am really excited to dig into this season finale. We have, of course, been covering The Pulp Avenger in this season of The Shadowcast. And uh, what a way to wrap it all up then with hands in the dark. We've been covering the first several entries in the Shadows oeuvre, if you will, and this season consequently has become a little bit longer than the other seasons. Uh, I don't know, two or three episodes longer as a result, and, and I'm more than happy to do it because I really love dissecting these pulp stories, particularly discussing what works and what doesn't about the early stuff, how it winds up building to better stuff, and of course, Talking about how quickly Walter Gibson really got on a roll. Look, the opening sort of trilogy of The Living Shadow, Eyes of the Shadow, and The Shadow Laughs really were one story sort of broken up into three pieces. You could probably publish those all, like if you edited out certain stuff, you could probably publish them all as one story, The Living Shadow, and not miss much. It probably doesn't need to be republished um, as each individual entry. That's actually an interesting idea. Somebody should probably go ahead and do that because I think it could work if you just reworked a few things. But it's interesting how quickly, man, we, we already had The Red Menace, right? Which is the fourth story. I would say by then, Walter Gibson pretty much had it figured out. Oh gosh, this is pretty much how you do this. You cut down the word count a little bit, up the energy level, take out the padding and get to the real nut of the story pretty quick and then keep leaning into that mysterioso keep hinting at who the shadow might be keep uh putting his agents in peril or the proxy hero in peril and we can see man we're already uh 10 11 entries in now and the shadow is rolling its sales were rolling at this time this was definitely the most popular single character pulp at that time really the character that brought back the single character pulps after for a long time for those who don't know pulps had been variety magazines the single character pulps like nick carter for example had fallen out of favor and so in the early 20th century it was all about the argoses of the world and the weird tales of the world and the sort of anthology magazines where you would have maybe some recurring characters black mask is one that comes to mind a big inspiration for walter gibson by the way and you would have some recurring characters like philip marlowe for example the continental op by uh, dashiell hammett but you didn't really have single character magazines until The Shadow went ahead and became this massive hit and really everyone started to follow suit at that point. And it was such a success that it became a little bit of a victim of its success. At this time, we're deep in the heart of the depression. This was a rare depression era commercial success. God only knows how successful The Shadow could have been in more favorable economic circumstances. I mean, the print runs for this magazine were exceptionally high for that time period. But you can, you can only imagine if pulps were popular at a time when people actually had money to spend. Gosh, just imagine it would have, they would have made even more. But who knows if those sales figures were actually true because something was happening at this time where unscrupulous vendors were actually cutting the covers off of the pulp magazines, selling them at half price to customers, and then sending the covers back to Street and Smith in exchange for a refund. This was an exchange program that they could do. And uh, Hands in the Dark actually marks an interesting attempt to deal with that issue. Newsstand owners returned unsold magazine by sending the publishers 
just the magazine's cover to avoid expensive mailing costs. When Street and Smith experienced problems with unscrupulous retailers ripping covers off their pulps so that they could sell the remaining coverless story at half price, the ever-inventive Walter Gibson came up with a clever solution. He tacked a short prologue onto Hands in the Dark, complete with coded street map, and had it printed right on the issue's cover. Now, shady retailers couldn't rip the cover off the issue without also discarding the beginning of the story. Now, Walter's cryptograms in the Shadow Magazine, as featured on this cover, one of my favorite covers, actually, they were considered so ingenious that several of them were actually later featured in Martin Gardner's book on cryptography. That was a guy who wrote for Scientific American. He was a known cryptographer. And I think I know what that means. Walter Gibson is clearly the Zodiac Killer. No, he was, <laughs> and I like this, this cryptogram. I love the unique idea of how this sorts out. This isn't one of, I would say, isn't one of the more complicated ones of the the shadows history or the ones that Walter Gibson would wind up employing, but it is one of my favorites because the way this works out, and, and I'm actually, believe it or not, on this episode, I'm gonna endeavor to not spoil stuff. Some stuff is going to have to be spoiled in order for me to cover some of the highlights of this uh, pulp, but I highly encourage you to read Hands in the Dark. I should probably mention it has been reprinted in the Sanctum reprints in volume number 130, and it's packaged with another excellent story called Murder Marsh, which up until this volume had never been reprinted. So there was no way to get this story until Anthony Tallon and Will Murray and whatnot uh, teamed up and put that out there. And actually, this is one of the volumes that when I go looking for Shadow Pulp reprints, seems to actually be out there a fair bit. Like I, I s have seen it on um, on some of the different websites that sell these pulp stories. So if you actually want to find this, you may be able to, otherwise eBay is gonna be your only recourse, but highly, highly recommend this one, because uh, especially if you can get it physically, because this is around the time they started adding more and more illustrations to the interiors of the Shadow Magazine. I'm going to have some of those on screen as I'm talking about this on the Shadow Cast. but uh, we're getting into the land of Tom Lavelle. We should probably talk about Tom Lavelle a little bit, because we're, we're going to get into more of the artistic stuff on the Shadow Cast. Um, as by necessity, because a lot of the stuff we're going to cover here on the Shadowcast is comic books going forward. But the interiors of the pulp artists at Street and Smith cannot be overlooked. One of the all-time favorites and widely agreed upon as, as one of the most talented to ever do it is Tom Lavelle. Tom Lavelle is without question one of the guys who wound up being one of the better known. Uh, he began his career in pulps. I mean, he wouldn't even work from roughs. He would just crank these things out. He'd have all his work done in an hour or two with a seven-day deadline or whatever. I think he had to have them out in 10 days, but because he was working on so many magazines, you know, he could do that pretty quickly, and he got pretty artful at it, no pun intended. These don't quite look like the work that Tom Lavelle would do later. They're maybe a little bit more composed looking. I'm not sure if he's using a brush here or not. The artist in me kind of wonders what technique exactly he was using. I know some pulp art was done with like charcoal pens. Some was done with a brush. Some was done with a pilot pen. It sort of depended on the artist. I love Paul Orban's stuff, but Paul Orban did a lot of different... Uh, techniques on the shadow he seemed to be using like a heavy brush on his stuff in like doc savage and the whisperer he seemed to be using a pilot pen or maybe even just a straight up ballpoint pen i don't know but either way it was really cool kind of a crosshatched look tom lavelle his illustrations are clearly a welcome addition and they're the the fact that they were received so well is likely the reason why there would be more and more artwork inside of the Shadow Magazine, which was not, it should be said, really the industry standard at this time. If you pick up a lot of pulps from 1930, 1931, this particular story is published in 1932, I believe. If you pick up a lot of these from other publishing houses you don't see that much artwork the shadow and doc savage and the whole street and smith line especially the the types that are aimed a little bit more at juveniles 
they wind up adding more and more illustrations. And I just love that. I think it adds a lot. It adds a style to it. I actually, I own quite a few of the physical shadow pulps and I love the advertisements in them and the little articles that they have kind of mentioning what's coming up from Street and Smith. So all that stuff is great. Regardless, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, this would actually begin the trend, this, this sort of gambit of printing the beginning of the story and the cryptogram on the cover in order to prevent these retailers from <laughs> from selling the book without a cover, right? This would actually begin the trend of including secret codes and cryptography on the cover of the Shadow Magazine. You can see also here the Chinese discs, which hides an English word in a bunch of faux Chinese characters. Very interesting there. And a, a pulp called the Ghost Murders, which is a lot of fun. This cover is also the first to feature the shadow entirely unmasked, which was sort of done with little fanfare. And he's looking somewhat skeletal, a little bit mauger and hawkish. Uh, many have speculated that the shadow was modeled physically after Sherlock Holmes. I, While his style of mystery, I think, is deliberately reminiscent, according to Walter Gibson it is anyways, he was not the literal physical model for the shadow, I don't think so. Uh, but rather he was modeled after Bill Lawler, who was the art director of the Shadow Magazine. And you can clearly see it because he would later grace the very same covers in photograph form in later editions. To put it bluntly, dude was a duck-billed platypus. That was a honker, my friends. Um, perfect, perfect profile. You love that aquiline profile uh, on a good mystery detective. Uh, very French. Of course, we would learn later that the Shadow's surname is French in nature. It's Allard. So uh, he's he's got a little bit of that uh, francophone kind of... Uh, he, he's got the beak. He's got the, the French beak. Uh, strangely enough, though, far from being des described as hawk-like, he is actually discover described as looking monk-like in this particular story. A reference, I guess, to the early promotional stills featuring the very first shadow actor on radio. That would be the late, great James Lacurto, of whom, sadly, no recordings have survived. Uh, hence, we have no idea what he may have sounded like in the role prior to him being replaced by the great Frank Reddick, who thankfully we do have some sound clips. Um, though it is interesting to mention, and a lot of people don't know this, he did later rejoin the cast and perform the role of Shrevy on old time radio. So if you want to hear James Lacurdo, even though he is not performing as the Shadow, you can hear the original Shadow on the Shadow radio program. He's just playing Lamont Cranston's taxi driver, Mo Shrevnitz. Who do you think killed him, Mr. Cranston? I don't know. Have you any ideas? Well, Mr. Cranston, I'd say a nut, I'd say. Uh, you better slow down here. Okay. Which is the residence we're looking for? Which is the residence? Uh, you, you can't see it from here. The entrance is through that iron gate. All right, then I'll park here. I've never seen a house with so many trays around it. i never seen uh, it's kind of spooky, ain't it? Uh, wait for us, baby. Okay, Mr. Cranston. I'll be waiting, but, but don't be too long. Don't be, please. The shadow speaks to the shadow, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a cool one. Like the Black Master and the Living Shadow before it, this is one of the formative pulp novellas where the shadow's actual countenance is seen by someone else in the story. We've still got this Mysterioso sort of vibe. I love that we're just getting little trickles of what he might look like and where he might have come from. In the inaugural entry, it was suggested his face was bandaged or disfigured. In The Black Master, it's said that he has no face. And in this one, his face is seen and described as ghastly and showing green in the eerie light. Now, the greatest thing about all of this is that it's just suggested, but it's never truly described. It lets your mind put it all together, which is the way to do this. You want a man of mystery, you gotta have mystery. It, the whole point of mystery is to let the human brain fill in the blanks because whatever that brain fills in is gonna be a lot more interesting than sitting there like Charles Dickens and painstakingly describing every 
ruddy tract of his face for 45 unremitting pages. This was the true genius of Walter B. Gibson on these early shadow issues. I submit, ladies and gentlemen, what is your, by the way, what is your assumption? I want to ask the members of the shadow cast, what is your assumption of what is going on with the shadow's face? Because we're going to talk a little bit later. There's a, a later story that describes him as reshaping his face in real time. That once he took his face away, there was like a wire framework upon which he created a false face. It suggested he might have been disfigured in World War One. In fact, that suggestion is made as early as the very first Shadow story. Of course, this is the early 30s. The really, not the immediate aftermath, but the aftermath of the Great War. And so the idea of artificial faces to cover disfigurement and so forth um, as a result of wartime injuries. I mean, there were some truly horrific injuries during World War I. That definitely would have been foremost on a lot of people's minds. So what is your assumption about this? I have my own ideas. Of course, the best, the, the simple greatest thing about it is that it's a giant question mark. So we get to debate it going forward. That's the best thing about it, right? Always better to not answer, but always good to put the question out there. What's your assumption about what is going on with the Shadow's mug? Now, speaking of the Shadow, we have far more than just the Shadow. We have his agents. We have Harry Vincent um, taking on a very small role here, just checking in on the whereabouts of the sort of heir, the, the central, well, not the heir, but the original wealthy man about town who dies apparently down in South America uh, checking up on his whereabouts Harry Vincent doesn't do a whole lot but uh, Clyde Burke who had some fairly serious employment issues during this issue is uh, is back to a semi-stable gig as a crime reporter for the classic after briefly running his clipping service uh, prior to that assassination attempt a couple of issues back. And just as in that story, the Shadow once again inhabits the alias of amateur criminologist George Clarendon rather than Lamont Cranston. We talked about him not long ago. Um, that is a guy's Gibson would later regret adding at all saying that he wished he'd stuck with an established Cranston right from the start. It, it may be for this precise reason that Cranston later takes on many of the features of George Clarendon, not least of which his exclusive membership in the famous Cobalt Club. A lot of people directly associate Lamont Cranston with the Cobalt Club to the point where when Lamont Cranston is introduced in the Shadow film in 1994, where is he sitting? The Cobalt Club. Well, Clarendon, actually, that's a feature of George Clarendon, not L Lamont Cranston. Lamont Cranston sort of assumes that later. Clarendon, of course, would never appear in another issue hereafter. Uh, Walter Gibson, I should say, has a strange predilection. I'm, I noticed this. He has a strange predilection for using the term revolver and automatic interchangeably. I assume he's not a big firearm aficionado, but those are two very different things. Um, of course, he uses automatic, which is just shorthand, right? Because these are semi-automatic handguns, not fully automatic handguns. Uh, don't tell that to anyone in Washington. But uh, he's he uses these terms revolver and automatic interchangeably whenever he's making reference to the Shadow's weaponry. But here there's a particular sequence in this book where it makes clear he is, revolving, he is removing sorry, a criminal's automatic and replacing it with one of his revolvers, <laughs> suggesting that in these early stories, it wasn't enough for the Shadow to be dressed like an Old West undertaker, you know, with the slouch hat and the Inverness cape and everything. And, and of course the duster coat that he's wearing. He was also apparently armed like one. He's got dueling six guns in some of these early stories. Again, we're, the Shadow's still taking shape here and that's part of the magic of these early stories. So early on, he's using a revolver and interestingly enough, he would use a revolver in the 1940s Shadow serial, the film serial. He was using a revolver, not an automatic in that. The core plot, I think, is one of the more inspired of the early Gibson efforts. I think the worst thing to be in a Shadow novel is an heir of great wealth. <laughs> and so the moment you hear Theodore Galvin is just such a thing, you know he's just as likely to be Deadski. 
uh, the titular hands in the dark refers to the sort of interesting method of execution employed by the criminal conspirators who are after said fortune. The strange characters of the cryptic message were a blood red hue. They were vivid and mysterious beneath the oval light of the desk lamp. A dead man's message. Reynold Barker looked about him as he spoke. The silence of his gloomy surroundings worried him. His fingers trembled. The paper crinkled. Even that slight sound was startling. The dark paneled walls of the room were oppressive to Reynold Barker. He felt that he was in their grip, that he could never leave them. He was in Theodore Galvin's study, the spot that had been his goal for seven days. He had found the paper in the secret drawer of the desk, the exact place where Galvin had told him it would be. But the silence of this sullen chamber was maddening. It brought back recollections of those dying eyes. Galvin's eyes. Barker steadied his nerves with mighty effort. He tried to laugh. It was excitement, he told himself. Shakiness following those long airplane hops from South America. He stared at the paper. His lips forced a smile as he comprehended its meaning. A sudden gurgle came from Barker's throat. Hands from the dark had gripped his neck. He dropped the paper and sought to break the throttling hold. He could not. His own hands were feeble. The clutching fingers tightened, choking, choking, choking. Reynold Barker's brain was whirling. His eyes were bulging but unseeing. He heard a roaring in his ears, louder than the thrum of an airplane motor. Then came blackness, sickening blackness more terrible than the shadowy darkness of that sinister room. Again, the strangling hands were tightening. But when the shadow interrupts one such event, the only remaining clue is a curious blood crimson cryptogram hinting at the location of Galvin's bounty. And this is sort of the core conceit. We've got an heir, we've got, we've already kind of played with this, right? In the eyes of the shadow, we had an heir who was supposed to have inherited a bunch of hidden gems. This is sort of a repeat of that. We're gonna repeat a lot of these motifs, but the thing that's cool about these early stories is every time you see one of these motifs repeated, Walter Gibson is improving at relaying them. He's making them ever more interesting. He starts playing with his own ideas, turning them on their heads, taking them apart, putting them back together. And um, Hands in the Dark has a really, a few interesting twists on this idea. Um, so when, when young Bob Galvin returns to reclaim all of this gold, needless to say, he is an immediate target. This poor kid gets kidnapped and replaced with a clumsily performed criminal double who manipulates everyone from the woman of the house, or the woman staying in the house, rather, uh, who's a childhood friend, I guess, of Bob Galvin, to the nearsighted housekeeper, sort of a decrepit uh, Alfred from the Batman comics, although it's debatable that uh, Alfred may have come from the fact that the Shadow and Lamont Cranston had a, uh, a butler who was named and recurring in these stories. Uh, but it's it's interesting that, you know, they they very quickly wind up culminating in the killing of one and the attempted murder of the other. You have your damsel in distress moment. There is some brilliant set pieces here, speaking of which. Um, there's an airtight chamber in the Galvin mansion used as an ingenious death trap during a really interesting sequence I still remember vividly from the first time I read it. Uh, for which the shadow must employ, I love these sequences, he must employ his most artful stealth tactics to penetrate the vault in time and save the damsel in distress. I love the way this is all described. There's criminals who are supposed to be watching her, they go down, to, I love the whole sequence down the stairs and all of it. Uh, I can't spoil it all because people live, people die, but the way that it's described, you, you're you kind of sure at the beginning of this sequence, there's a lot of sequences where Walter Gibson loves to present a situation that seems like, oh, the shadow will never be able to get in there. He'll never be able to get in there in time. And then he finds a way to get in there. There's He's either got a plan or he improvises. In this case, I think he's mostly improvising, which is kind of cool. Um, you get a lot of 
from early shadow stories especially, you get a lot of situations where the shadow just has it all worked out from the beginning, and it's a matter of sort of unveiling just how he figured it all out, right? This story's not one of those. He's figuring it out as he goes along. He he does pick up some clues that other people don't, but uh, very cool. Immediately, we there's a lot of supporting characters in this one, I have to say. Um, I won't say it gets confusing, but a few of the characters probably don't need to be there. The woman of the house, the woman staying in the house, sort of gets kidnapped, is in the chamber, and then goes away. Like, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with anything. There's a number of criminals all conspiring, all of whom have uh, fairly forgettable names, although Gibson is doing a better job here. There's a de detective named Zull. You know, that you're not likely to forget that name. <laughs> so he's sort of trying to do a better job of making sure that all the names pop out at you and you remember them so that you don't get bogged down as much in, oh God, do I remember that guy? Especially if you read the story over repeated sessions, that can really become a problem. Of course, with shadow pulps, why wouldn't you just sit down on the john or wherever else and read the whole thing in one sitting, give or take an H. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really, really like this one. Uh, of course, what would any shadow pulp be without a Chinatown sequence? I, I do have to say, though, this particular Chinatown sequence is sort of wasted as there's this series of traps and snares that all seem like they're going to be bigger obstacles than they actually wind up being. So consequently, the entire incident sort of comes across as narrative padding, like, to be honest. Like, that was a problem that a lot of people identified in The Living Shadow, but I actually didn't have a problem with The Living Shadow Chinatown sequence. I thought Walter Gibson seemed pretty inspired during that whole sequence, but this, uh, this here is just like, why was that in there. I don't know. Y you think it's going to be a lot better than it is. Um, this, I should add, the subsequent novel, the one immediately after this, Double Z, which I recorded a full audiobook of, puts in an infinitely superior effort during its Chinatown aside, and I can't recommend that serial killer epic highly enough. That whole Chinatown sequence is really memorable. Um, I'm often asked... What makes the shadow unique among his contemporaries, uh, among his offshoots? And without question, I think it is his core philosophical frame. They got into this a little bit in the comic book Masks, where the shadow had a tete-a-tete -tete with the Green Hornet, and the Green Hornet was more of an agent of law, and the shadow made clear he was more of an agent of justice. And they go back and forth over, you know, that there is law and there is justice, Mr. Green Hornet. And uh, I am, obviously, the shadow is more an advocate of justice. I, I find that really interesting. The, the idea that justice, not law, is truly inviolable. Meaning, ultimately, functionally speaking, if an authority figure, be it politician or policeman, runs afoul of that interpretation of justice... He will happily move against them as well, just as violently as they may have moved against someone else. Now, in this case, uh, how to put this without spoiling anything, the, the the policeman who is at least implicated in this is, is not the core ring leader. So this is not like the villain of the story. But make no mistake, in 1931, especially at the height of Prohibition, when organized crime, urban crime was a big thing, it would have been risque indeed to actually cast a policeman as being corrupt enough uh, to be exposed in this way and to be put against a vigilante crime fight. I mean, this is, when you really break it down, the shadow is putting, is putting it out there that he's not afraid to be an outlaw in the name of justice. That's really what this is. It, in fact, it's just this philosophy that leads to one of the greatest entries in the Shadow's litany of criminal justice monologues. When the villain at the core of this caper is revealed to be none other than a corrupt police officer. A whispered laugh came in response to Zul's exclamation. 
The acting inspector had heard that laugh before. Sullenly, he raised his hands. Tonight, came the shadow's whisper. You pay the penalty. For what? For your crimes. Zol stared, brutally sullen. A big man on the force, said the shadow contemptuously. Tipped off to certain crimes by crooks to add to your prestige. In return, you have protected them when they needed it, and have been paid for that protection. Cover-up man for a group of criminals. That is ended now. Your pals are dead. All but one who is escaped. Tonight, you may do penance. Your career on the force is ended. Its smirches are not known. We shall let it stand, and so reflect no discredit upon the force. More than that, we shall add to your ill-gotten prestige. I have need of you tonight. Come, learn how the shadow deals in justice. There's some fine prose in here, uh, but a lot of it is a little too spoilery to talk about. Even that was a little more spoilery than I would have liked. But uh, it's so quintessentially shadow. I mean, in, in terms, I, I don't know that there were many other monologues in these early shadow novellas that are quite on that caliber. I mean, come hear how the shadow deals in justice. Come on, guys. I, that ought to be printed on a shirt, for crying out loud, with a photo of the shadow with guns akimbo <laughs> pointing them outward. That's, I mean, come on. That's just got to happen. Uh, hands in the dark. A bit of a missed opportunity on certain things. I think the Chinatown sequence either could have been cut out or, or possibly, actually, this is a rare case where I think it probably should have been expanded. I mean, there's a portion of this story where there's a, a poison gas chamber and such. Maybe because the previous story included a poison gas chamber, maybe he didn't want to quite go that far again. Maybe he was worried of repeating gimmicks or whatever. But I thought it was really cool and would have been interesting to see the whole sequence expanded. As it happens, it, there's like uh, Wing Ko, I think is the name of the uh, evil Chinaman du jour here. And he has a, a sort of a thuggish henchman. And it, the whole sequence is over so quickly. Like I, I barely even remember all of the details about it. And that's probably a bad sign because the rest of the plot I remember with crystalline clarity. Hands in the Dark is... You know, it's not perfect, but I'd probably give it like a 4, 4.5 out of 5, something like that. It's still really, really good. It probably doesn't wind up in my top 10 of all time, but boy, if if you were reading these first 10 shadow stories right at a clip, I would actually say I don't recommend that you stop with this one. Even though it's fantastic, you'd probably, if you stopped with this one and just started reading whatever you wanted, you probably wouldn't be too ill-served. But I have to say, I think the better story to stop with, if you were going to read the first several, is Double Z. Um, Double Z is a better story than this. It's a five out of five. It's a really good serial killer kind of mystery. Hands in the Dark is a, a really interesting sort. It has a good sort of contrivance for the plot. It has an interesting plot in general, actually, and some cool characters. But then it has some characters that are just glorified appendages. It even has some shadow agents, like Harry Vincent really doesn't have much of a role in it. He's sort of a glorified appendage. Um, definitely not on the level of Black Master, definitely not on the level of Double Z, which will come immediately after. And of course, uh, to mention it a second time, I of course recorded an audiobook for Double Z. I'll probably upload it to this channel at some point, but um, I, I'm rather uh, proud of how that turned out. And if you want to read that story, that's uh, certainly one way to sort of do it by proxy. This has been the Pulp Avenger, the new season of the Shadowcast. We are now wrapping it up. And I can't tell you, it's it's been such a blast to go through all of these early pulp stories. And again, if you want to get into the Shadow Pulps, I recommend you begin with the first 10, probably 11. I would Again, like I said, I would stop with Double Z and then just sort of take off because after this formative phase, we eventually hit the more established phase of the shadow where we're now building out the mythos. We're starting to add more of the agents and those agents are becoming recurring and we're getting to know names like Jericho Druk and Miles Crofton and so on and so forth. Eventually, Margot Lane. And uh, this is, however, I have to say, these early novels, 
this is a magic period. This is a period, there's something that the established shadow phase doesn't have that this does, and that is just this sense that the shadow could be anything and anyone. He could have any ability. He could have magic powers for all we know. Uh, and some of the feats that he's able to carry out in these early books certainly could, to a layman, be ascribed to having magic powers. That is a very, very cool aspect. It's, some, it's a mystique. There's no other word to use. It is a mystique. It's something that Batman has lost. It's something Superman's lost. It's something superheroes have lost. They don't have any mystique anymore. We're too worried about who they're banging. We're too worried about, you know, their personal life in general. What are their politics? What are their... This is... The com comics have gotten all out in the weeds on this nonsense. And I think we have lost the ability to understand that the audience reading a story, reading a comic, reading a book, reading a pulp, whatever, are more able archivists in a way of these characters than are modern practitioners of the rights. In the sense that the thing Walter Gibson did, the thing great mystery writers do is begin the thought. It's the audience's job to fill it in. These early pulps, especially not to say that the established ones don't do this as well but the early ones really are masterful at giving you just a rough outline of who this character is and letting you infer the rest there's so much suggestion in these stories in the black master we got a sequence where the shadow is described as having no face the man of many faces with no face of his own like, what does that even mean? All I know is it makes my mind race. It makes me wonder what this character is, who this character is, what his abilities are, if he's disfigured. I don't know. I don't know. There are sequences, especially in, in The Living Shadow, where, especially that sequence where Harry Vincent is in the back of a car and the, and the shadow is sort of bearing him away to safety and all he, he just knows there's a shadowy shape in, in the front of the car and you can't even catch a glimpse of him like these moments where you're just wondering who is this is he a villain like what is going on here I don't even know at times but I am enthralled because I'm not being told there's a lesson there if they ever make a shadow show a shadow movie they need to take hard notes from these first 10 pulps because if you made a movie where instead of making the whole movie about the superhero you made it about the proxy hero and then this character of the shadow is dropped in ill-defined not defined he might be lamont cranston who is he we don't know right that if there's one failing of the 94 film and i don't think it has many failings actually i quite enjoy that movie but if there's one failing, it's that um, it was a little too preoccupied. It kind of had that 90s preoccupation, sort of a, pro a preoccupation we still have with trying to flesh out the man behind the shadow. Oh, Lamont Cranston knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. I mean, how many times we hear that during the promo clips? Gosh, if you watch any of the behind the scenes stuff. The Shadow, David Kep, pretty good screenwriter. No no offense at all. He was on a roll during this period, and I don't think his screenplay for The Shadow is that bad. But his core conceit was the Shadow knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men because he has been tempted by evil. He has fallen himself, and he has fallen back from the brink, or come back from the brink. What appealed to me initially about bringing, making The Shadow into a film was, was really the character of this of this perfect, but not perfect, almost perfect, but not even almost perfect, slightly tainted man who does nothing but good. He's got an evil streak in him that's, that's substantially there. I mean, the key to this is, is, is a line that I'm sure we've all heard of, is what evil lurks in the hearts of man, who knows? Well, the shadow knows. Well, how does he know? He knows because he kind of came from that. He was a bad dude at one point in his life. The idea that we had for the script was the shadow knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. If, he, if he's going to know about evil, he must have had some experience with it himself. 
I mean, an interesting conceit, much more interesting than a lot of superhero films at that time, certainly in terms of that dynamic. Even Batman wasn't really exploring that in film form, as dark as the Burton films got. Really wasn't there yet in the mid-90s. But The Shadow went there. I mean, it's cool. But I would so much rather have a mystery story with a lot of action and narrow escapes and death traps and all of that fun where the pathos and the emotion is really coming more from the agents, is really coming more from Harry Vincent or the proxy hero or whatever, right? And the shadow is an elemental force and we just are guessing who is he? What is he? Why is he keep, what are his abilities? How does he keep coming in at the crucial moment and saving the day? And can you imagine how magical that moment will be when the shadow finally opens his mouth and says something? Like how incredible, just completely in silhouette. Not even seen. Man, it's funny. I always get uh, questions. What is your dream casting? Who would you like to be to play Lamont Cranston? And it's like, oh, could you miss the point any harder? Uh, if they do a shadow movie right, we should barely know who the actor is. You know, we should. He should be identifiable by his voice. He should be in silhouette. He should be in shadow constantly. This should be portrayed as this like ancient immortal force almost that's uh, all powerful and all knowing in a weird way you should be wondering the heights and depths of his abilities that to me is the magic of all of these early pulp stories and that's one of the reasons i de decided to devote an entire season of the shadow cast to just going through the first 10 or so stories so that you guys can sort of get up to speed on who this character is we will of course be reviewing more pulp stories as we go forward and our future uh seasons will have a little bit looser of themes i'm sure but this had to be done because a lot of people haven't read the pulps for one you guys really need to dig into this stuff but also because there's something really really cool and almost mystical to take away from the portrayal of the shadow this early on. A, a lesson that I think not only the rights holders of The Shadow, Condé Nast, or whoever winds up holding the rights by the time they make a film or TV show or whatever, or a new comic, there's a lesson to take away here. And that is less is more. This is the dictionary definition of a chiaroscuro character. This is a character who is defined as much by what isn't visible, what isn't known, as what he is. We don't care if he has magic. You know, that's the whole point. One of the reasons people still debate what the Shadow's abilities are, is he actually a master of hypnotism and so forth, is not just because of the incongruities in the between the radio version, the comic version, and the pulp version. It's because he was deliberately kept vague by Walter Gibson, because Walter Gibson was, beyond being a fantastic writer, he was an illusionist. He was a master of sleight of hand. And these early shadow adventures really represent one prolonged exercise in genius level, like prodigy level narrative sleight of hand. I, I said in one of the early uh, issues that I actually reviewed, I believe it was Lingo. I think it was the Lingo story. When I reviewed that in one of our first episodes, maybe even the first, I said, man, Walter Gibson is great at one... He's got one thing that I've never really seen in a lot of mystery writers. Usually if I'm reading a mystery, love you, Dashiell Hammett, love you, Raymond Chandler, but sometimes I read your stories and I already know what's coming at the end. To their credit, Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett are not really about the quality of the mystery. Not about really who done it. It's more about the swagger and the style and the sort of themes as you get there, right? It's more about that. That's what defines film noir literature. But as a mystery writer, Walter Gibson's one of the only people, not always, but a lot of times, who I don't see the twist coming at all sometimes, which is so much fun in a book. It's something we so rarely get nowadays. Nobody possesses the ability to do that. And it should be mentioned. 
Walter Gibson was a neophyte mystery writer at this time. He was just getting into this field. He's only 10 shadow stories deep. He had done a lot of writing, make no mistake, but it wasn't, it wasn't mystery writing. He hadn't done professional commercial mystery writing to this point. This is really, really ahead of the game in terms of that. He was just a guy who loved to write and was really, really good at it. I hope that this season of the Shadow Cast, the Pulp Avenger, has persuaded a lot of people to look into the life of Walter Gibson and look into the Shadow, of course. I should mention before we sign off here that the Dark Avenger, the book that Will Murray name dropped on this very podcast, is actually out. Uh, this is the second volume of his new series on The Shadow, kind of a modern updating of his Duende history of The Shadow, but way better fleshed out. And actually, the thing I was just discussing, the different phases of The Shadow in terms of fiction, something he touched on in our interview, is um, actually something that he goes over fairly exhaustively in the new book. I'll have a full review of that going forward. I, as this is the finale, I don't really wanna get into that right now. I really just wanted to focus on this pulp and sort of summarizing the season in general. Probably in the next episode, if not, maybe the one after that, I'll either review it or possibly even interview Will Murray again. I would love to have him on the show again, in addition to some other guests that I think would be a blast to talk to. Until next time. As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs>